The Stuarts are the not very successful line who succeed Elizabeth. So when Elizabeth dies, James I, a Stuart, comes down from Scotland and takes the throne. He's universally disliked and I would say universally unpleasant. He's succeeded by his son Charles I, who is so universally disliked that they try and get rid of him in the Cromwell Revolution and ultimately behead him. Then you would think that England was going to be a republic for the rest of the time. But on the death of Oliver Cromwell, the leader of the rebellion, Charles II is invited back to England and everybody thinks they'll have a go with the Stuarts again. He's the merry monarch, he's the one that we all think about as having this glamorous restoration court and he's succeeded in his turn by his brother James who is a committed Roman Catholic and committed to a very tyrannical view of kingdom, of monarchy, which ultimately leads to not one but two subsequent revolutions, one by the Duke of Monmouth who I discuss a lot, who I feature in the novel very much, and ultimately by his own daughters, Mary and Anne, the princesses, and Mary takes the throne with her husband, William. When the people basically vote against James II by expelling him from the kingdom and welcoming in the arrival of his daughter, Mary, with her husband, William of Orange, there's a new settlement between people and the king. The people, the working people themselves, the people that I like to write about in Tidelands, don't get much of a look in. The agreement is done by the lords who rule the House of Commons and rule the House of Lords, of course. And their agreement with William is a settlement about that monarchy will not overstep into tyranny ever again. And it's basically that settlement that the English Constitution is based on today.